Hello everyone and welcome to Just Disciple. My name is Ken and this is Kenny. We are so excited to talk to you guys today because we've been going through some controversial issues as of lately and so far we are in a two-part series on is homosexuality a sin? Mm. Last time we talked about this, we talked about the act versus desire and we specifically focused on the act of homosexuality. Uh, today we are going to talk about the desire, you know, where sometimes we, we've clearly stated in Christianity that uh, the act is a sin, mm-hmm. right? But now there are different camps and different perspectives when it comes to the desire of sin within Christianity, right? So in, in, in discussing those. But in order to discuss those, we got some preambles, right? We got mm-hmm. some things that we want to make sure we have a proper framework of. And that first framework is the difference between temptation versus sin. Can you walk us through what's the difference between temptation versus sin? Yeah, I think it's, this is a really good question to ask first. Because this is the one people say, you know, people, sometimes people will say, well, homosexuality, acting out on it is sin. A man having sex with a man clearly is sin, but a man wanting to have sex with a man or being attracted to a man. And I think the reason why that's, that gets muddled quickly is because people do have a misunderstanding. So I'm mean, going to use a non-sexual sin pattern as, a, as just to try to help maybe clear that up a little bit. Um, let, let's say someone, let's say a father... Uh, is a single dad. He's got two kids, and he's poor, and he's struggling to make ends meet. And so, um, so he goes to the grocery store to buy some food for his kids. But you know, he, he can't buy a lot, and he man, he wish he could buy more for his kids. And so he's walking through the grocery store, and uh, let's say, um, you know, he you know, he sees that the camera that usually would be watching you is busted. So he knows, and that there's an employee at the supermarket who turns around and then drops like a big old steak on the ground. And, like, and he starts walking away. He doesn't realize there's a big stake there. Like, at this moment, the, the father sees a stake on the ground, and he has an opportunity to steal it, and he knows he can get away with it. Um, so th- that, that's a temptation, right? This is an opportunity that presents itself. Sometimes it's kind of just circumstances that kind of just fall together. Sometimes it's someone literally offering you something. Like, there could be so many different reasons why you're tempted. Um, but it's, it's, it's an opportunity that in many situations would seem tempting yeah. or seem alluring. Uh, Jesus was tempted, right? We knew that we know this in the Gospels. Jesus was tempted by Satan while he was fasting. Jesus was sent to do something specifically by the Father. Satan comes along and says, I'll give you this if you disobey the Father and do this. So there's a real temptation there. Jesus is being presented with an opportunity that would seem very alluring to, to most humans. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick on mission. Yeah. So Jesus never sinned. So to, to, be, to be offered sin or to have an opportunity to do something that would even seem alluring to you is not sinful, clearly. Um, That's what you would define as temptation. Correct. That would be a temptation. If that dad in that scenario picks up that steak, puts it in his pocket, he has now stolen and that's, that is sinful, right? And we can argue about the ethics and morality. Was there a good reason to do it or not? Do it? And I use that illustration intentionally because the reason, the reason, there's a part of you who go, well, is it that bad? Because he's trying to feed his kids, right? No, it, it's still theft. Yeah. It's still wrong, right? There may be, there may seem to be a good reason to do it, but it's still dishonoring to God. So I, I intentionally use that illustration as a means to like, there are sometimes there seems to be a good reason to sin. But it's still wrong. It's still sin. I think it's important. Um, now, I, 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 as we were, we were talking about this before we started recording, it's not a perfect illustration yeah. to homosexuality because sexual sin is different than all other types of sin. Um, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6 that sexual sins are not just outward. All other sins are just outward. You're doing something that affects you or other people in an outward fashion. But sexual sin is inward. You're actually doing massive harm to your own soul, your own psyche. Um, it's, it's painful. It's damaging. Um, so sexual sin, when you commit it, has a far deeper uh, impact on you and a detriment. And therefore, the, 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 the lines between what is sinful when it comes to sexual sin and what is sinful with other sins, it's not as easy to decipher. The, the eating, the, t- taking the steak, clearly sin. On the sexual side of sin, things get far blurrier and grayer and much harder to draw the line. Is this sin? Is this, you know, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're a married man. I, God willing, will be a married man one day. Um, if you're attracted to a woman other than your wife, is that sin? I think most of us would say no. But at some point, you could be lusting after another woman. 
And where do you draw that line? And and who determines that? You right. know, like I'm, and I could con- uh, you know, convince myself that I'm not lusting after her. I'm just really drawn to her attraction for long periods of time. <laughs> but God may be like, no, bro, you are lusting yeah. for sure. You know, so it, it is definitely blurry and muddy in that sense. Yeah, um, I think I think also um, there there are different types of sin. We we covered this in a previous video. Yeah. Uh, there are different types of sin. So you want to walk us through kind of the different iniquity versus transgression. Yeah, so, so the biggest thing is that transgression, you know, when we talk about sin, transgression is the actual act of right. committing the sin. And you see that throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament. But then every once in a while in the New Testament, you'll see the word iniquity. And the word iniquity it means that there's something wrong with inside of us. There's something sinful. Romans chapter 7, Romans 1 to 3 talks about this, that at, there is something wrong, corrupted. You know, Psalms 55, at birth we were born into iniquity. Uh, so that is our does our, our inclination our without Christ is that we want to gratify ourselves all the time and that's iniquity yeah I've heard people describe it it's like a spiritual cancer yeah that's in your soul and even having it is bad and wrong even even having the cancer inside of you the spiritual cancer you have sinned um, I want to make it clear I'm talking about a spiritual metaphor I'm not, I'm not saying if you have physical cancer you've sinned that's not yeah. what I'm saying Good <laughs> um, the, the spiritual disease inside of you that makes you want to sin even having that thing of itself is sinful yeah. is how the Bible seems to talk about it and, and just to be clear everyone every single sinful. one of us yeah. everyone has iniquity that's how we're born yeah right so and so that's the difference so now we got these four words that we're using right temptation which you have clarified is an opportunity to sin sin is in the act and then the word transgression is actually committing that act mm-hmm. right and the iniquity something that we have born within us this desire the, these evil inclinations to pursue things that are not of god right right it's it's everything away from god so that being said man we we kind of given a framework mm-hmm. to this question is is the desire for same-sex attraction a sin? What are the three perspectives that within Christianity we would have? Right. Among, you know, amongst Christians who would say the Bible is authoritative. And we, you know, there's people who would say the Bible, you know, they have more liberal theologians. Yeah. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. And, and from our previous video, we've talked about the actual act is a sin. Right. That's where Christians would land. Mm-hmm. Right. But now we're talking about the actual desire. We have three different camps within our, our Christian brothers right and sisters so you have the um, the first the first group of people are people that would say yes the action of homosexuality is sinful being attracted to someone of the same sex is not sinful at all and it's actually almost they almost make it un, kind of lighthearted it's like well ju- just like the guy saw the steak and may want to eat the steak but chose not to st- pick up yeah. the steak he didn't sin um, that they kind of equated that it's like the desire of a man liking a man or wanting to have sex with a man or, or being attracted to a man or a woman being attracted to a woman, there's nothing sinful about it at all. It's not broken. It's not wrong. It's just something. It's just like you like chocolate ice cream. I like vanilla ice cream. You like girls. This guy likes boys. Whatever. It's not a sin to like chocolate or vanilla. Just don't eat the ice cream God said don't eat. Yeah. Like that's, so it's a very, very bare bones, clear cut perspective on that. All right, so that being said, right, I, I can imagine some people get some flack with that, right? Mm-hmm. What's the other perspective when it comes to uh, the desire in homosexuality? Um, the, the one that's kind of tied to the first one a little bit is these are people who would say same-sex attraction is a broken desire. You know, we shouldn't say, well, it's no big deal. We should say, no, this is broken. We should not compare it to a steak that's on the ground you could steal, yeah. right? We, we shouldn't compare it to that because it's different. They would say the desire of liking someone or being attracted to someone of the same gender, the same sex, is a broken desire, but you haven't committed an actual sin. Yeah. So it's it's a product of sin. It's broken because of sin. Clearly, there's something wrong. Because of iniquity. Right. That's what we're talking about. There's something wrong right. within us. Um, but there's still a distinction that the orientation or the attraction is still not itself sinful. It's broken you can even say it's it's flawed. It's 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 got a it's you can use an elementary term to say it's bad, um, but there's this it's this idea. It's 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 kind of like I heard I heard a pastor John Piper describe it, saying like he would say, and I think he would be in this camp. I think he would say something like, um, you know, it's like imagine you um, you're in a car accident and then you're handicapped. Like you you walk with a significant limp all the days of your life. Yeah. Well, clearly there's something 
broken, you know, in your leg. It's causing you to limp. You're significantly limited and handicapped now for the rest of your life. And you're limping and you're in pain. So clearly it's not right. But is it sin? Is it a sin to limp? Yeah. Like, not necessarily. Like that, 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 yes. So John Piper would say that spiritual limp of being attracted to the same sex is a brokenness that could cause you to sin or lead you to sin, but in and of itself is just a broken limp of your soul. That's how we should treat it. That's, that's and, how you would argue about it. And, and I, I wonder if this analogy will, will fit with yours too, that, that I was thinking about. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Is that, you know, as we look at brokenness, right, we have to remember that all of our, the world is broken. We're all mm. broken. Yeah. Everything is broken because of sin. Um, so I'm even thinking about just my body right now. While I might not have been in a car accident, sooner or later, because of the brokenness, the fallenness of mankind, I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. Right? That was not God's intended design. So even the fact of me dying is brokenness, you know, like this broken thing that we're like, it's showing that there's something broken. And the reason I emphasize this is that sometimes people will say, oh, you have a broken desire. Well, that's just sinful. Well, no, there are things that don't fall under the category of sin, but that are broken. And that I think would be one category that like, no, this is just a broken part of the fall of man. Yeah. And this, this category is where most, it feels like I could be wrong. I haven't, I haven't read any hard data where most prominent evangelical leaders are kind of in this camp. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've already mentioned John Piper. There, there are many others that would say, yes, uh, yeah, homosexual orientation or d- attraction, same-sex attraction, clearly is broken. Clearly it's a product of sin. If we lived in a, in a world of mankind where sin, we had never sinned, no one would ever have same-sex attraction. Yeah. Um, where I think the first category would say, well, if humans had never sinned, it would... Men could still be att- occasionally attracted to other men. They just wouldn't do it yeah. because we're a world without sin. Like so, there's there's a distinction there. I think most evangelicals, most you know, biblical Christians would say, yes, same sex attraction is broken. It's a, it's a, it's a flaw. It could easily lead you to sin, but in and of itself, a dude being attracted to a dude is not sinful in and of itself. Yeah. Um, that that's kind of a prominent camp right now. Yeah. And within that camp, there's a lot of nuances to that camp. Tons of nuances, yeah. I feel like when we were talking about this before the recording, there's not really three perspectives. If you were to break this one down, there's like 70 perspectives yeah. because of how nuanced this one is. And, and people use different terminology. They use different caveats. and it, Yeah, it, it gets really blurry really fast. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, we're trying to just give you a, a simple framework yeah. to, to understand it. Uh, what's the last perspective? So, so far, the first one was there's nothing wrong with orientation. Just don't act on it, right? The second one was... Uh, same-sex attraction is a broken desire. Uh, and then what is the last one? Thing? The, the last one is becoming more and more... Of a, this, this would have been the most prominent view throughout large chunks of church history. It's become much more a minority view. And this is the idea that, that not just is the action of homosexuality sinful, but even the attraction, same-sex attraction, is sinful in and of itself. Um, and this is currently being really being talked about a lot. Guys like Denny Burke, Owen Strand... Uh, Heath Lambert, there, there, there's a crew of guys that are saying, hey, we're not sure that we're in the, the second category that a lot of the other prominent guys are in. Um, and, and there's a lot of Christian leaders that are, they're not sure. Yeah. They're kind of an in-between. Um, and so again, there's a lot of caveats and a lot of nuances and a lot of blurriness. But this third category is the category I think I would put myself in. As I would say is that not only is the action sinful, but I think the desire itself is sinful. And I, I think I instantly have to address some things people are maybe thinking. If, if you are a person who you call yourself gay, if you're someone who wrestles with same-sex attraction, I want to first say to you, like, Jesus loves you. Like, he does. He loves you. Um, and, like, your sin and your brokenness is not any worse than my sin or Ken's sin or anyone else's. And, and we live in a society where the church, for the last few decades or centuries, have done a bad job of, of that. It made people like you who wrestle with this feel like yours is yeah. worse. And then you hear someone like me say... Well, even your desires are sinful that you can't control. It feels like you can't control. Yeah. You're going, what the heck, Kenny? Like, why should I even try? Like, I think that's. I think guys like uh, that are in that like a John Piper and others. I think sometimes they're nervous to say this is sinful because the person who then who hears it and goes, why should I even try? I'm, gonna, I'm sinning without even trying. Yeah, they feel stuck. They're like yeah. in this endless cycle that they're like, this desire just came out of nowhere. I'm hanging out. I'm hanging out with friends, and all of a sudden the thought comes up. Yeah. What do I do? And so I, I, the lingo I've started to use, which isn't precise theological language, I, rather than using category of, of broken desires and sin, sinful actions, 
I'm using the I'm using the categories as of uncontrollable sin and controllable sin. That's kind of the category I'm starting to use. I don't think there's any theologians out there using that language. But uh, I'm just making <laughs> you it up. Just coined it today. Yeah, I don't exactly. even know the date. Um, and so I would say the the thing you can control is the action. If you are a man attracted to a man, you can control whether or not you choose to go to bed with another yeah. man. You can control that, and you're expected to control it. You're expected to be obedient to the word and to not go into that. Then there's sins that come that are in us that we can't control. They're still sinful. Because and the reason I believe that is like in the Old Testament, David is praying, he's asking God for forgiveness of his iniquity. Forgive me for my iniquity. Forgive me for the disease inside of me that causes me to choose to sin. Yeah. Why would you ask for forgiveness of something if there's no need to be forgiven? You only, you're only need to be forgiven for things that are sinful. And so I, I think that's I, I think that's I think it's sinful. But, but I want to I want to give a huge caveat is that you actually can't control it sometimes. But if you're a newer Christian, you you're, you 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 sin uncontrollably. You you just you wake up, you're a man liking another man, and you don't know why. Um, I, I had I got I got to know a guy who's actually attracted to little children of pedophilia. He struggled with pedophilia. Um, he never acted out on it, but talking to him, going, he said, "Is it sin for me to even like little children?" I said, "Yes. I think it's a it's a broken desire." And it's a sinful desire that you can't control. So what you can control is don't look at kitty porn, right? Yeah. Um, he actually had gone to prison for th- for several years for consuming kitty porn um, on the internet. And so um, I said, don't look at children children child pornography. Don't ever don't ever touch a child inappropriately. Don't ever put yourself in a position where you might accidentally do that, right? Yeah. Avoid the temptation if you can. Um, there's, there, but I said, and I told him, you're committing a sin that you can't control. You just, you like little children. You're attracted to them. You're sexually attracted to a four-year-old. You can't control that, but God can control it. Yeah. And so I would, I encourage you. I, I told him, I encourage you. Go to the Holy Spirit every day. God, forgive me of this thing inside of me. Cleanse me of it. Convert me of this if you can, Lord. Trans, deliver me. Um, now, do I believe God is going to deliver most people who deal with pedophilia or homosexuality or other sinful, broken desires? In most cases, the answer is, in my experience, is no. God could do it. He might do it. He has done it. But it seems to be rare. Yeah. It seems to be God's MO is, is to allow you to go through that for an extended period of time. Um, and, but, he, but if you ask me, he will give you the grace. He will give you the power to fight the sin. To fight, to fight, to fight against the sins you can control. Yeah. The controllable sin. And, and just to clarify, you're not saying that God's never going to deliver you from it right. ever. Right. But, you know, sometimes when we, we pray, deliver me from the sin, sometimes we're like, deliver me from the sin right now so that I never struggle with it. But the process of sanctification sometimes is going to be, like, like Corinthians says, is one degree to another. Yeah. And sometimes it's going to be two steps forward, three steps back. And you're just going to be like, am I ever going to get out of this? But 10 years from now, if you keep fighting and with the grace and power of Jesus Christ, you're going to be like, you're going to look 10 years from now and be like, I remember when I used to have these uncontrollable thoughts, uncontrollable sins in my heart, where now I've been able to fight them for 10 years. Praise God. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's the important part within within that conversation of making sure people don't walk away like, oh, I guess I'm screwed. Right. I guess I'm in this endless cycle of desire. And, and, and even with that, just a caveat of like, we know that not everyone is going to have this uncontrollable desire 24 seven. Right. But what we're talking about is like, there are going to be days you're completely fine. There's no struggles. There's no issue. You're walking around, you feel like a normal person. Right. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, wham, the, like you just have these influx of thoughts that you cannot stop. And you see one person and it just triggers for hours on end. And you're thinking to yourself, is this ever going to end? And it's in that moment where you're saying, we have to rely on the power of Christ. Yeah. Um, so that's my encouragement. Someone told me recently, I actually have a, a friend, uh, she would call herself a lesbian, but she's a celibate. She loves Jesus, believes the Bible says it's wrong. Yeah. So she's not going to, she's going to not be married for all the days of her life is, is her current plan. And, um, and she's excited about that. She's embraced celibacy. And so I remember, remember I was having a conversation with her and she said, well, it's not sin for the like, to like it. That's why I do believe it. She goes, well... She goes, you don't realize, Kenny, what damage that does to people in the gay community. And I said, that might be true, but, but if, if I see that in Scripture, I have to point out what I think is right. And so she asked me, well, how, why, why do you think that this brokenness inside of me is actually me sinning? And I said, um, and I defined it this way. I said, sin is a, I said, the literal English word 
for sin is comes from a, it's an old arch old English archery term. It literally means to miss the mark. So God says, here's the standard. The standard is be like me. Like God creates Adam and Eve and says, Adam and Eve, be like me. Be perfect the way I am perfect. Adam and Eve sin. And then for the rest of the time, humans are sinning and sinning. Anything we do that misses this mark, anything we do basically that God would not do is sin. So I have to ask, if, if God were human, and he was, right? if God were human, would, would he, be, as a man, have a sexual attraction to other men? Would he be a sexual attraction to little children? Would he have sexual attraction to that which is sinful? The answer is a resounding no. Like, the scripture is clear. I, I think the scripture would, 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 the testimony of scripture would say no. God wouldn't like a man if he were in your shoes, but you do like a man. You're doing something God would not do. Even though it's uncontrollable, even though you felt this way ever since you were you're very young, you have done something that God would not do. You have missed his standard of perfection. So by definition, you have missed the mark. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3. That's, that's the, but the, the literal sense of the word sin. You have sinned in that case. Although you've done it in a way that's uncontrollable or, or not intentionally. It wasn't a transgression. It wasn't a choice to do that. It was something you're... you're your psyche just does on its yeah. own. Um, and in that moment is when we go, oh God, forgive me for this thing. And God, help me to, 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 to not fall into this. Continue to cleanse me. And allow this to be the thing that motivates you or, or thrusts you towards spending time with, with Jesus. Yeah. And, that, and that's awesome. That's great information. Kenny, as we think about these three perspectives, and you know, at the end of the day, the, the thing I'll say, depending on what camp you're in, all, all, all these people are still believers, right? We still right. love each Absolutely. other. It's not like we're going against one another on this. Um, and I think all of us, to some extent, will, will say, while there might be these three camps on the starting, the root problem, the solution is Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Amen. And the solution is, hey, we're going to try to love you as best as we possibly can, which we have not done the best at sometimes in society, right? The second thing is that we are going to push you to follow Jesus, mm -hmm. right? And that to follow the commands of Jesus through the power and of, of the Holy Spirit. Without that, right, it doesn't matter what perspective you're in. If you're not doing those things, right, as believers and helping those who struggle with this, we, we've missed the mark Yeah, I agree. As, as people. So hopefully that uh, helps you guys as you're thinking through this. If you know people who struggle with it, if you struggle with it, man, pray, pray to the Lord, regardless of the perspective that the Lord will keep cleansing you and making you more like Jesus. We hope you guys have a great day and God bless. Love you guys. Love you.